This play is called Our Town. It was written by Thornton Wilder. The name of Our Town is Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, just over the line from Massachusetts. Longitude 42 degrees 40 minutes, latitude 70 degrees 37 minutes. The first act shows a day in Our Town. The date is May 7th, 1901, just before dawn. Yeah, just about. The sky is beginning to show some streaks of light over in the east there, back of our mountain. The morning star always gets wonderful bright the minute before it has to go. Well, now I'll show you how our town lies. Up here is Main Street. Cutting across it over there on the right is the railroad tracks. Across the tracks is Polish town. You know, foreign people that come here to work in the mill, a couple of Canuck families, and the Catholic church. The congregational church is over there. Presbyterians across the street. Methodist and Unitarian are over there. Baptist is down the hall, by the river. Next to the post office, there is the town hall. Jail is in the basement. Brian once made a speech from those steps there. Along Main Street, there's a row of stores. Hitch and Post have horse blocks in front of them. First automobile is going to come along in about five years. Belong to Baker Cartwright, our town's richest citizen. Lives up in the big white house up there on the hill. This is the grocery store and Mr. Morgan's drug store. Most everybody in town manages to look into these stores once a day. This is our doctor's house, Doc Gibbs. And this is Mrs. Gibbs' garden. Corn, peas, beans, hollyhocks, heliotrope, and a lot of burdock. In those days, our newspaper came out twice a week, the Grover's Corner Sentinel. And this is Editor Webb's house. And this is Mrs. Webb's garden. Just like Mrs. Gibbs, only it's got a lot of sunflowers, too. Right here is a big butternut tree. Nice town, you know what I mean? Nobody very remarkable ever come out of it, so far as we know. The early states on the tombstones up there in the cemetery say 1670. They're Grovers and Cartwrights and Gibbses and Herseys. Same names as around here now. Well, as I said, it's early morning. The only lights on in town are in a cottage over by the tracks where Polish mothers just had twins. And in the Joe Crowell house, where Joe Jr. is getting ready to deliver the morning paper. And at the depot, where Shorty Hawkins is getting ready to fight the 545 for Boston. Yeah, there she is. Naturally, out in the country all around, they've been lights on for some time, what with milking and so on. But town folks sleep late. So another day's begun. There's Doc Gibbs coming down Main Street now, coming back from that baby case. And here's his wife coming downstairs to get breakfast. Doc Gibbs died in 1930. New hospital is named after him. His wife died first, a long time ago, in fact. She went out to visit her daughter, Rebecca, who married an insurance man in Canton, Ohio, and died there, pneumonia. But her body was brought back here. She's up in the cemetery there now, in with the whole mess of Gibbses and Herseys. She was Julia Hersey before she married Doc Gibbs in the Congregational Church over there. In our town, we like to know the facts about everybody. And there's Miss Webb coming downstairs to get her breakfast, too. That's Doc Gibbs. Got the call to Polish Town at half past one this morning. And there's Joe Crow delivering Mr. Webb's Sentinel. Morning, Doc. Morning, Joe. Want your paper now? Yes, I'll take it. Anybody been sick? No, I'm fire twins over in Polish Town. Joe, I hear your teacher, Miss Foster, is going to get married. Yes, sir. It's your fellow over in Concord. I declare. Well, how do you boys feel about that? Well, of course, it ain't none of my business. But I think when a person says that to be a teacher, she ought to stay one. Well, how's your knee, Joe? Fine, Doc. I never think about it anymore. Only like you say, he always tells me when it's going to rain. What's the time today? Gonna rain? Ah, uh, no, sir. Sure? Yes, sir. He ever make a mistake? No, sir. Now, I want to tell you something about that boy Joe Cole there. Joe was awful bright. Graduated from the high school here ahead of his class. So he got a scholarship to Boston Tech. MIT, that is. Graduated ahead of his class from there, too. It was all written up in the Boston papers at the time. Going to be a great engineer, Joe was. But the war broke out and he died in France. Yes, sir, all the education for nothing. What business he had picking a quarrel with the Germans, we can't make out to this day. But it all seemed perfectly clear to us at the time. Come on, Miss David. What's the matter with you? Here comes Howie Houston delivering the milk. Morning, Doc. Morning, Howie. Somebody sick? A pair of twins over to Miss Grosowski's. Twins, eh? This town's getting bigger every year. Gonna rain, Howie? No, no, fine day. It'll burn right through. Come on, Bessie. Hello, Bessie. How old is she, Howie? Going on 17. 
Bessie's all mixed up about the root, ever since the Lockhart stopped taking their quart of milk every day. She wants to leave McCourt just the same, keeps scalding me the whole trip. Good morning, Howie. Good morning, Miss Gibbs. Doc's just coming down the road. Is he? Seems like you're late today. Hey, yeah, uh, something went wrong with the separator. Don't know what it was. Doc, Howie? Children, children, time to get up. Come on, Missy. Everything all right, Frank? Yes, I declare easy as kittens. Bacon will be ready in a minute. Sit down and drink your coffee. You can catch a couple hours sleep this morning, can't you? Mrs. Wentworth's coming in at 11. I guess I know it's about to. Her stomach ain't what it ought to be. I'll told you won't get more than three hours sleep. Frank Gibbs, I don't know what's going to become of you. I do wish you could go away someplace and take a good rest. I think it would do you some good. Emily, time to get out. Wally, seven o'clock. I declare you've got to speak to George. Seems like something's come over him. He's no help to me at all. I can't even get him to cut me some wood. Is he sassy to you? No, he just whines. All he thinks about is that baseball. George, Rebecca, you'll be late for school. George? George, look sharp. Yes, Mom. Uh, Don't you hear your mother calling you? Wally, you'll be late for school. Guess I'll go upstairs and take 40 winks. Wally, you wash yourself good or I'll come out and do it myself. Mom, what dress shall I wear? Don't make a noise. Your father's been out all night and he needs to sleep. I washed it on your blue gingham for you special. Oh, I hate that dress. Oh, hush up with you. Every day I go to school dressed like, like a sick turkey. Now, Rebecca, you always look very nice. Mama, George is throwing soap at me. I'll come up and stop to both of you. That's what I'll do. You got a mill in our town, too. Hear it? Makes blankets. Cartwright's on it, and it's sprung my fortune. Well, now, children, I won't have it. Breakfast is just as good as any other meal, and I won't have your goblin like fools. It'll stunt your growth, that's a fact. Wally, put away your book. Oh, Ma, by 10 o'clock, I gotta know all about Canada. You know the rules well as I do. No books at table. Well, as for me, I'd rather have my children healthy than bright. I'm both, Mama, you know I am. I'm the brightest girl in school from my age. I have a wonderful memory. Eat your breakfast. I'll speak to your father about it when he's rested. Only it seems to me 25 cents a week's enough for a boy your age. I declare I don't know how you spend it all. Oh, Ma, I got a lot of things to buy. Strawberry phosphates, that's what you spend it on. Well, I don't see how Rebecca comes out of so much money. She doesn't want a dollar. I've been saving it up gradual. Well, dear, I think it's a good thing to spend some every now and then. Mama, do you know what I love most in the world, do you? Money. Eat your breakfast. There's the first bell. I gotta go. Now walk back, but you don't have to run. Wally, pull up your pants to knee. Tell Miss Foster I send her my best congratulations. Can you remember that? Yes, Ma. You look real nice, Rebecca. Pick up your feet. I don't know. It sounds crazy, I suppose. 
But I've been promising myself if we ever had the chance. How does the doctor feel about it? Well, I did beat about the bush a little and said that if I got a legacy, that's the way I put it, I'd make him take me. Well, what did he say? You know how he is. I haven't heard a serious word out of him since I've known him. <laughs> no, he says, I might make him feel discontented with Grover's Corners to go traipsing about Europe. Better let well enough alone, he says. Every two years he makes a trip to the battlefields of the Civil War. And that's enough treat for anybody, he says. Well, Mr. Webb just admires the way Dr. Gibbs knows everything about the Civil War. You know, Mr. Webb's a good mind to give up Napoleon and move over to the Civil War. Only Dr. Gibbs, being one of the greatest experts in the country, only makes him despair. It's a fact. Dr. Gibbs is never so happy as when he's at Antietam or Gettysburg. The times I've walked over those hills, Myrtle, stopping at every bush and pacing it all out like who's going to buy it. Well, if that second-hand man's really serious about buying it, Julia, you sell it. Then you'll get to see Paris all right. Just keep dropping hints from time to time. That's how I got to see the Atlantic Ocean, you know. Oh, I'm sorry I mentioned it. Only it seems to me that once in your life before you die, you ought to see a country where they don't talk in English and don't even want to. Thank you very much, ladies. Now we'll skip a few hours. But first, we want to know a little more information about our town. Kind of a scientific account, you might say. So I've asked Professor Willard of our state university to sketch in a few details of our past history here. Professor Willard? May I introduce Professor Wood of our State University? Just a few brief notes. Thank you, Professor. Unfortunately, our time is limited. Grover's Corners. Let, let me see. Grover's Corners lies in the old Pliocene granite of the Appalachian Range. This is some of the oldest land in the world. We're very proud of that here. Of course, there are some more recent outcroppings. Sandstone showing through a shelf of Devonian basalt and some vestiges of Mesozoic shale. But these are all comparatively new, perhaps two or three hundred million years. So, some highly interesting fossils have been found. I may say unique fossils. Two miles north of the, the Peckham Farm in Silas Peckham's cow pasture. These fossils can be seen in the museum at the university at, at any time. Well, well that, that is at any reasonable time. Sh shall I read some of Professor Gruber's notes on the meteorological situation? Mean precipitation, etc.? I'm afraid we won't have time for that, Professor. You might have a few words on the history of man here. Oh, anthropological data. Uh, yes. Early Amerindian stock, Cotahatchee tribes. No evidence before the 10th century of this era, now entirely disappeared. Possible traces of migration in three families, migration in the early part of the 17th century of English brachiocephalic blue-eyed stock. Um, since then, some Slav and Mediterranean. And the population, Professor Willard. Within the town limits, 2,640. Just a moment, Professor. Oh yes, that's correct. At the present time, the population is 2,642. The postal district brings in 507 more for a total of 3,149. Mortality, birth rates, constant. By McPherson's gauge, six Thank you very much, Professor Willard. I know we're all very much obliged to you. Not at all, sir, not at all. Now the political and social report. Editor Webb? Oh, Mr. Webb? He'll be here in a minute. He just cut his hand while eating an apple. Thank you, Mrs. Charles, everybody, please. Mr. Webb is publisher and editor of the Grover's Corner Sentinel. That's our local paper, you know. Well, I don't have to tell you that we'll run here by a board of selectmen. All males vote at the age of 21. Women vote indirect. We're a lower middle class, sprinkling on professional men. 10% uh, illiterate laborers. Politically, we're 86% Republican, 6% Democrat, 4% Socialist, rest indifferent. Uh, religiously, we're 85% Protestant, 12% Catholics, the rest indifferent. Have you any comments, Mr. Webb? A very ordinary town, if you ask me. A little better behaved than most, and probably a lot duller. But our young folks seem to like it well enough. 90% of them graduating from high school settle down right here to live, even when they've been away to college. Now, is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask Editor Webb any questions about our town? Is there much drinking in Grover's Corners? Well, man, I don't know what you call much. Saturday night, it's the fall dance. We've got an elevator in our stable at home, so. We've got one or two town drunks, but they're always having horses every time an evangelist comes to 
town. An old man might say liquor ain't a regular thing in the home here, except for in the medicine chest. Right good for a snake bite, you know. Always was. Is no one in this town aware of? Come forward, will you, where we can all hear you. What was I going to ask? Is no one in the town aware of social injustice and industrial inequality? Oh, yes, everybody is. Something terrible. Seems they spend most of their time talking about who's rich and who's poor. Then why don't they do something about it? Well, I don't know. I guess we're all hunting like everybody else is, for a way the diligent and sensible can rise to the top, and the lazy and quarrelsome can sink to the bottom. But it ain't easy to find. In the meantime, we do all we can to help those who can't help themselves, and those that can, we leave them alone. Are there any other questions? Mr. Webb. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Webb, is there any culture or love of beauty in Grover's Corners? No, ma'am, there's not much. Not in the sense you mean. Come to think of it, there's some girls that play piano down at the high school commencement, but they ain't happy about it. No, ma'am, there's not much culture. But maybe this is the place to tell you that we've got a lot of pleasures of a kind. We like the sun coming from over the mountains in the morning. We all notice a good deal about the birds. We pay a lot of attention to them. Or we watch the change of seasons. Yes, everybody knows about them. But those other things, you're right, ma'am. Robinson Crusoe in the Bible, and Handel's Largo. We know all that. And Whistler's mother. Those are just about as far as we go. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Now we'll get back to the town. It's two o'clock. All 2,642 have had their lunches, that all the dishes have been washed. The children have gone back to school. There's a buzz and a humming from the school buildings. Only a few buggies left on Main Street. Horses dozing at the hitching posts. There's an early afternoon calm about the town. You all remember what it's like. Doc Gibbs is in his office, tapping people and making them say on. Mr. Webb's cutting pawn over there. One man in ten kids is a privilege to push his own model. I can't go. I gotta go home and help my mother. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye. See you tomorrow in class. Emily, walk simply. Who do you think you are today? Oh, Papa, you're terrible. One minute you tell me to stand up straight, and the next minute you call me names. I just don't listen to you. Golly, never got a kiss from such a great lady before. You're terrible! Excuse me, Mrs. Forrest. You go out and play in the field, young man. You got no business playing baseball on Main Street. Awfully sorry, Mrs. Forrest. Hello, Emily. Hello. You made a fine speech in class today. Well, I was really ready to make a speech about the Monroe Doctrine. But at the last minute, Miss Corcoran made me talk about the Louisiana Purchase instead. I worked an awful long time on both of them. Gee, it's funny, Emily. From my window up there, I can just see your head nice when you're doing your homework over in your room. Why can you? Yeah, you certainly do stick to it, Emily. I don't see how anyone can sit still that long. I guess you must like school. Well, I always feel it's something you have to go through. Yeah. I don't mind it, really. It passes the time. Yeah. Hey, Emily, what do you think? We might work out a kind of telegraph from your window to mine, and every once in a while you can give me a hint or two on one of those algebra problems. Well, I'm hoping the answers. Of course not, Emily. Just some little hint. Oh, I think hints are allowed. So if you get stuck, George, you whistle to me and I'll give you some hints. Emily, you're just naturally bright, I guess. I figure it's just the way a person's born. Yeah, but you see, I want to be a farmer. And my Uncle Luke says whenever I'm ready, I can come over and work in this farm. And if I'm any good, I can just gradually have it. You mean the house and everything? Yeah. Well, I've heard of you getting out in the baseball fields. Thanks for the talk, Emily. Good afternoon, Mrs. Webb. Good afternoon, George. So long, Emily. So long, George. Emily, come help me string these beans for the winter. Well, George Gibbs let himself have a real conversation, didn't he? Why, he's growing up. How old would George be? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. He must be almost 16. Mama, I made a speech in class today, and I was very good. Well, you must recite it for your father at supper. What was it about? The Louisiana Purchase. It was like silk off a spool. I'm going to make speeches all my life. Mama, are these big enough? Try and get them a little bit bigger if you can. Mama, will you answer me a question serious? Seriously, dear, not serious. Seriously, will you? Of course I will. Mama, am I good looking? Well, yes, of course you are. 
Fourth, my children got good features. I'd be ashamed if they hadn't. Well, Mama, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, am I pretty? Well, I've already told you, yes. Now that's enough of that. You've got a nice, young, pretty face. Never heard of such foolishness. Well, Mama, you never tell the truth about anything. Well, I am telling the truth. Mama, were you pretty? Yes, I was, if I do say it. I was the prettiest girl in town, and next to Mamie Cartwright. But, Mama, you've got to say something about me. Am I pretty enough to get anybody, to get people interested in me? Emily, you make me tired. Now stop that. You've got a pretty enough face for all normal purposes. Now come along and bring that bowl with you. Well, Mama, you're no help at all. Now I think this is a good time to tell you that the Cartwright interests have just begun building a new bank in Grover's Corners. Had to go to Vermont for the marble, sorry to say. And I've asked a friend of mine what they should put in the cornerstone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, they're putting a copy of the New York Times and a copy of Mr. Webb's Sentinel. We're kind of interested in this because some scientific fellas have found a way of painting all that reading matter with a kind of glue. Silica glue. That'll make it keep a thousand, two thousand years. We're putting in a Bible, a copy of the Constitution of the United States, and a copy of William Shakespeare's plays. What do you say, folks? What do you think? You know, Babylon once had two million people in it, and all we know about them is the names of their kings, some copies of wheat contracts, and the sales of slaves. Yes, every evening all families sat down to supper, and the father came home from his work, and the smoke went up the chimney, same as here. And even in Greece and Rome, all we know about the real life of the people is what we can piece together out of a few joking poems and the comedies wrote for the theater back then. So I'm going to have a copy of this play put in the cornerstone so the people a thousand years from now will know a few simple facts about us. More than the Treaty of Versailles and Lindbergh fight. See what I mean? So people a thousand years from now, this is the way we were in the provinces north of New York at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the way we were in our growing up and in our marrying and in our living and in our dying. Now we'll get back to Grover's Corners. It's evening. You can hear the choir practice going on at the Congregational Church. All the children are at home doing their schoolwork. The day is running down like a tired clock. How do you mean? 
afternoon and sing at Fred Hersey's wedding. Show your hands. That'll be fine. That'll be right nice. Once again now, art thou weary, art thou languid? It's a question, ladies and gentlemen. Make it talk. And remember Sunday to take the second verse real slow and sort of die out at the end. Ready? George, I'll only keep you a minute. George, how old are you? Me? I'm 16, almost 17. And what do you plan to do after school's over? Well, you know, Pop. I want to be a farmer on Uncle Luke's farm. You'll be willing, will you, to get up early and milk and feed the stock? And you'll be willing to hoe and hay all day? Sure I will, Pop. What do you mean? Well, George, when I was in my office today, I heard a funny sound. And what do you think it was? It was your mother chopping wood. There you see your mother getting up early, cooking meals all day long, washing and ironing, and still she has to go out in the backyard and chop wood. I suppose she just got tired of asking you. She just gave up and decided it was easier to do it herself. And to eat her meals and put on the clothes she keeps nice for you, you go out and play baseball and she's some hired girl. We keep her on the house, but that we don't like very much. Well, George, I knew all I had to do was call your attention to it. Here's your handkerchief, son. George, I've decided to raise your spending money 25 cents a week. Not, of course, for chopping wood for your mother, because that's the sort of gift you give her. But because you're getting older, and I imagine there are a lot of things you find to do with it. Thanks, Paul. Tomorrow's payday. You can count on it. Hmm. Probably Rebecca feels she ought to have some more, too. I wonder what could be keeping your mother. Choir practice was never as late as this before. It's only half past eight, Paul. I don't know why she's in the old choir anyway. She hasn't got any more voice than an old crow. Drapes around the streets at this hour of night. By the time you're tired, don't you think? Yes, Paul. I can always be louder than that for this. I thought everybody Good night, Martha. Good night, Mr. Foster. I'll tell Mr. Webb. I know he'll want to put it in the paper. Okay. Why is late? Good night. Murder Webb, look at that moon, will you? Potato weather for sure. Well, naturally I didn't want to say a word about it in front of those others. But now that we're alone, really, it's the worst scandal that ever was in this town. What? Simon Stinson. Now Luella. Now, Julia, to have the choir director of the church drink and drunk year after year. Luella! Now, Julia, you know that he was drunk tonight. Now, Luella, we all know about Mr. Stimson. We all know about the troubles he's been through. And Dr. Ferguson knows, too. And if Dr. Ferguson keeps him on there at his job, the only thing the rest of us can do is just not to notice it. Not to notice it? But it's getting worse! No, it isn't, Luella. It's getting better. Now, I've been in that choir twice as long as you have. It doesn't happen anywhere near so often. Why, I hate to go to bed on a night like this. Gracious, I'd bear to hurry. Those children be sitting up till all hours. 
Good night, Luella. Julia. Good night, Myrtle. Can you make it home safe, Luella? Oh, it's as bright as day. I can see Mr. Soames scowling at the window now. You think we've been to a dance, so I meant Bo carry on. Good night, Julia. Good night, Luella. See you on Sunday. See you then. Well, we had a real good time. You're late enough. Oh, Frank, it ain't any later than usual. And you stopped at the corner to gossip with a lot of hens? Now, Frank, don't be grouchy. Come out and smell my heliotrope in the moonlight, huh? Come on. My, isn't that wonderful? What did you do all the time I was away? Oh, I read, as usual. What were the girls gossiping about tonight? Oh, believe me, Frank, there was something to gossip about. Hmm, Simon Stevenson far gone, was he? Worst I've ever seen him. How'll that end, Frank? Dr. Ferguson can't forgive him forever. I guess I know more about Simon Stimson's affairs than anybody in this town. Some people ain't made for small town life. I don't know how that'll end, but all I can do is just leave it alone. Get in. No, not yet, Frank. I'm worried about you. What are you worried about? I think it's my duty to make plans for you to get a real rest and change. And if I get that legacy, I'm going to insist on it. Now, Julie, let's not go over that again. Oh, Frank, you're just unreasonable. Now, Julie, it's getting late. First thing you know, you'll catch cold. I gave George a piece of my mind tonight. I reckon you'll have your wood chop. For a while, anyway. No, no, start getting upstairs. Oh, there's so many things to pick up, seems like. You know, Miss Fairchild always locks her door at night. All those people up that part of town do. They're all getting certified. That's the trouble with them. They haven't got anything fit to burgle, and everybody knows it. Get out, Rebecca. There's only room for one at this window. Well, let me look just a minute. Well, use your own window. I did, but there's no moon there. George, do you know what I think? Do you? I think maybe the moon's getting nearer and nearer, and soon there'll be a big explosion. Rebecca, you don't know anything. If the moon were getting any nearer, the men that sit up all night with their telescopes would see it first, then be in all the newspapers. Is the moonshine on South America, Canada, and half the whole world? Well, probably is. 9.30. Most of the lights in town are out. There's Constable Warren trying a few doors on Main Street. And here comes Editor Webb after putting his newspaper to bed. Evening, Bill. Evening, Mr. Webb. Quite a moon. Yeah. All quiet tonight. Simon Stimson is rolling around a little. Just saw his wife moving out to hunt for him, so I looked the other way. There he is now. Evening, Simon. Town seems to have settled down tonight pretty well. Good evening, yes. Town seems to have settled down tonight pretty well, Simon. I guess we'd better do the same. Can I walk along the ways with you? Good night. I don't know how that's going to end, Mr. Webb. He's seen a peck of trouble, one thing after another. Oh, Bill, you see my boy smoking cigarettes. Give him a word, will you? He thinks a lot of you, Bill. Oh, I don't think he smokes no cigarettes, Mr. Webb. Least ways no more than two or three a year. I hope not. Good night, Bill. Good night, Mr. Webb. Who's that up there? Is that you, Myrtle? No, it's me, Papa. Why aren't you in bed? I don't know. I just can't sleep yet. The moonlight is so wonderful. The smell of Mrs. Gibbs heliotropes. Can you smell it? Hmm. Yes. Haven't any troubles on your mind, have you, Emily? Troubles, Papa? No. Hmm. Don't let your mother catch you. Good night, Emily. Good night, Papa. I never told you about the letter Jane Prophet got from a minister when she was sick. He wrote Jane a letter, and on the envelope it was like this. It said, Jane Prophet, The Prophet Farm, Grover's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, The United States of America. What's funny about that? But listen, I'm not finished. The United States of America, Continent of North America, The Western Hemisphere, The Earth, The Universe, The Mind of God. That's what it said on the envelope. What do you know? Yep, and the postman brought it just the same. What do you know? That's the end of the first act, friends. You can go out and smoke now. Those that smoke.
Three years have gone by. The sun's come up over a thousand times. Summers and winters have cracked the mountains a little bit more. And the rains have brought down some of the dirt. Some babies that weren't even born before have begun talking regular sentences already. And a number of people who thought they were right young and spry have noticed that they can't bound up a flight of stairs like they used to without their hearts fluttering a little. All that can happen in a thousand days. Nature's been pushed and contrived in other ways, too. A number of young people fell in love and got married. Yes, the mountain got bit away a few fractions of an inch. Millions of gallons of water passed by the mill. And here and there, a new home was set up under a roof. Almost everybody in the world gets married, you know what I mean? In our town, there aren't hardly any exceptions. Most everybody climbs into their grave married. The first act was called the daily life. This act is called love and marriage. So, it's three years later. It's 1904. It's July 7th, just after high school commencement. That's the time most of our young people jump up and get married. As soon as they've passed their last examinations and solid geometry and Cicero's orations, looks like they suddenly feel themselves fit to get married. It's early morning again. Only this time it's been raining. It's been pouring and thundering. Mrs. Gibbs' garden and Mrs. Webb's here, drenched. All those bean poles and pea vines, drenched. All yesterday, all along Main Street, the rain looked like curtains being blown along. Hmm. Don't know now. May begin again any minute. There's the 510 train for Boston. And there's Mrs. Gibbs and Miss Webb come down to fix breakfast. Just as if this were an ordinary day. I don't have to point out to the women in the audience that both these ladies they see before them. Both these ladies cook three meals a day. One of them for 20 years and the other for 40. And no summer vacation. They raised two children apiece, washed, cleaned the house, and never had a nervous breakdown. Never thought themselves hard used either. It's like what one of those Middle West poets said. You gotta love life to have life, and you gotta have life to love life. It's what they call a vicious circle. Here comes Sally Lee from Bessie delivering the milk. And here comes Cy Cole delivering the papers like his brother before him. Morning, Howie. Morning, Cy. Anything in the papers I should know about? Nothing much, except we're losing about the best baseball pitcher Grover's Corners ever had. Yeah, I reckon he is. Now all he'll be doing is pitching hay. Whoa, Bessie. I guess I can stop and talk if I have a mind to. He could hit, too, and run bases. Oh yeah, mighty fine ball player. I don't see how a man could give up a thing like that just to get married. Would you have, Howie? Can't tell, Cy. Never had no talent that way. Morning, Howie. Morning, Bill. You're up early. Morning, Mr. Warren. Seen if there's anything I could do to prevent a flood. River's been rising all night. Cy Quirrell here is all broke up about George Gibbs retiring from baseball. <laughs> yes, sir, that's the way it goes. In 84, we had a player, Cy, and then even George Gibbs could have touched him. Name of Hank Todd. Went down to Maine and become a parson. Wonderful ball player. Howie, how's the weather seem to you? It ain't bad. Think maybe the player's good. Bill? Howie? Morning, Miss Gibbs. Good morning, Howie. Sorry about the weather. It's been raining so hard that maybe it'll clear up. I certainly hope it will. How much did you want today? Well, I'm going to have a house full of relation, Howie. Looks to me like I'll need three of milk and two of cream. Three of milk and two of cream. My wife says to tell you how so we hope they'll be happy. No, Thanks wedding. a lot, Howie. Tell your wife I hope she makes it to the wedding. Maybe she can. She'll be there if she can. Good morning, Miss Webb. Oh, good morning, Mr. Newsom. I know I told you four quarts of milk, but I'm hoping you can spare me another. Yes, and two of cream. Well, it started raining again, Howie. Well, I was just saying to Mrs. Gibbs as to how it might clear up. Oh, and Mrs. Newsom told me to tell you specials how we hope they'll be happy. No, they wouldn't. Well, thank you, and thank you, Miss Newsom. And we're counting on seeing you at the church. Oh, we hope to be there, all right. Couldn't miss that. Come on, Bessie. Well, Ma, the day has come. You're losing one of your chicks. Now, Frank, don't you say another word. I feel like crying every minute. Sit down and drink your coffee. The groom's up shaving himself. Only there ain't an awful lot to shave. Whistling and singing like he's glad to leave us. Every now and then he says, I do, to the mirror. But it don't sound convincing to me. I declare, Frank, I don't know how they'll get along. I've arranged his clothes for him and seen what he's got warm things on and his feet are dry. They're too young, Frank. Emily won't think of such things. 
He'll catch his death of cold within a week. I remember my wedding morning, Julia. Now don't start that, Frank. I was a skater young fellow in the state of New Hampshire. I thought I'd make a mistake for sure. When I saw you coming down that aisle, I thought you were the prettiest girl I'd ever seen. The only trouble was I'd never seen you before. There was in the Congregational Church, married a total stranger. Well, how do you think I felt? Frank, weddings are perfectly awful things. Farces, that's what they are. Here, I've made something for you. Why, Julia Hersey, French toast. It ain't hard to make, and I had to do something. How did you sleep last night, Julia? Well, I heard an awful lot of the hours struck off. Oh, yeah. I get a shock every time I think of George setting out to be a family man. That great gangland thing. I'll tell you, Julia, there's nothing so terrifying in the world as son. The relationship of, between father and son is the damnedest awkward. Well, mother and daughter's no picnic, let me tell you. They'll have their troubles, I suppose. But that's none of our business. Everybody has a right to their own troubles. Uh, yeah, people are meant to live two by two in this world. It ain't natural to be lonesome. Do you know one of the things I was scared of when I married you, Julia? I will go along with you. I was afraid we didn't have material for conversation. One lasts us a few weeks. <laughs> I thought we'd run out and eat our meals in silence. That's a fact. And well, you and I have been conversing for 20 years now without any noticeable bearing spells. Well, good weather, bad weather. Taint very choice, but I always find something to say. Did you hear Rebecca stirring around upstairs? No. Only day of the year Rebecca has been managing everybody's business up there. She's hiding in her room. I got the idea she's crying. Lord sakes, this has got to stop. Rebecca! Rebecca, come and get your breakfast. Good morning, everyone. Only four more hours to live. George Gibbs, where are you going? I'm just stepping across the grass to see my girl. Now, George, you don't go out without your galoshes on. It's raining tourists. You don't go out without you prepared for it. <laughs> Ma, it's just a step. George, you'll catch your death of cold and cough all through the service. George, do as your mother tells you. From tomorrow on, you can kill yourself in all weathers. But while you live in my house, you live wisely, thank you. Perhaps Miss Webb isn't too used to callers at 7 in the morning. At least drink your coffee. I'll be back in a minute. Good morning, Mother Webb. Good morning, George. Goodness, you frighten me. No, George, I hate to say it. You can stand here a minute out of the rain, but really, you understand, I can't ask you in. Well, why not? Well, you know as well as I do, George. The groom can't see his bride on his wedding day, not until he sees her in church. Well, that's just a superstition. Good morning, Mr. Webb. Good morning, George. You don't believe in that superstition, do you? There's a lot of common sense in superstitions, George. Millions have followed it, George. And don't you be the first to fly in the face of custom. Well, how's Emily? She hasn't waked up yet. I haven't heard a sound out of her. Emily's asleep? Well, no wonder. We were up till all hours sewing and packing. Now, I tell you what I'll do, George. You sit here down here with Mr. Webb a minute, and I'll run upstairs and see if she don't come down and surprise you. Now, there's some bacon, too, but don't be long about it. Well, George, how are you? I'm fine. Mr. Webb, what common sense could there be in a superstition like that? Well, George, on her wedding day, her girl's head's full of, oh, you know, clothes in one thing or another. Don't you think that's probably it? Uh, yes, I, I never thought of that. Girls have to be a mite nervous on a wedding day, George. Gee, I wish a person could get married without all that marching up and down. Every man that's ever lived has felt that way, George. But it hasn't been any use. It's the women folk who build up weddings, my boy. A man looks pretty small at a wedding. For a while now, they have it all their own. All those good women standing shoulder to shoulder, making sure the knot's tied in a mighty public way. But you believe in a dungeon, Mr. Webb? Yes. Oh, yes. Don't misunderstand me, George. Marriage is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. Now, don't you forget that. No, sir. Mr. Webb, how old were you when you got married? <laughs> well, you see, I'd been off to college and taken time to get settled. But Mrs. Webb, she wasn't much older than Emily is. Old age hasn't got much to do with it, George, compared with other things. Well, what were you going to say, Mr. Webb? <laughs> I don't know. Was I going to say something? George, I was remembering the other night the advice my father gave me when I got married. Charles, he said. Start right off showing who's boss. Best thing to do is give a word about something, even if it doesn't make sense. Just so she'll learn to obey, he said. <laughs> then he said, if anything about her irritates you, 
her language, conversation, or anything. Just get up and leave the house. That'll make it clear to her. And oh yes, he said, never let your wife know how much money you have. Never. Mr. Webb, I couldn't exactly... And so I took the opposite of his advice, and I've been happy ever since. So let that be a lesson to you, George. Never ask advice of anybody on personal matters. George, you can raise chickens on your farm. What? Are you going to raise chickens on your farm? Yes, Uncle Luke's never gone in for chickens much, but I've been thinking on reading up. A book came to my office the other day on the Philo system of raising chickens. I wish you'd read it. Thing is starting a small way myself in the backyard. We're gonna put an incubator in the cellar. Charles Webb, are you talking about that incubator again? Why, I thought you two be talking about things more worthwhile. Well, Myrtle, if you want to give the boys some good advice, I'll go upstairs. Now, George Emily has to come down to meet her breakfast. She sends you her love, but doesn't want to lay her eyes on you. Now, goodbye. Goodbye? Guess you don't know about that older superstition, Myrtle. What do you mean, Charles? Since the caveman. No bridegroom should see his father-in-law on the day of the wedding, or near it. Now, remember that. Thank you very much, Mr. and Mrs. Webb. Now, I have to interrupt again here. You see, we want to know how all this began, this wedding, this plan to spend a lifetime together. I'm awfully interested in how big things like that begin. You know how it is. You're 21 or 22 and you make some decisions. Then wish you're 70. You've been a lawyer for 50 years. And that white-haired lady by your side has eaten over 50,000 meals with you. How do such things begin? George and Emily are going to show you now the conversation they had when they first knew that. As the saying goes, they were meant for one another. But before they do that, I want you to try and remember what it was like when you were very young. And particularly the days when you were first in love. When you were like a person sleepwalking. And you didn't quite see the street you were walking in. And you didn't quite hear everything that was said to you. You're just a little bit crazy. Will you remember that, please? Now, they'll be coming out of the high school at 3 o'clock. George has just been elected president of the senior class, and is, this is June. That means he'll be president of the senior class all next year. And Emily's just been elected secretary and treasurer. <laughs> yeah? There they are coming down Main Street now. I can't believe I gotta go home. Oh, Ernestine, Ernestine, could you come over tonight and do Latin? Gee, I don't know, Emily. Isn't that sister of the worst thing? Sure is. Well, tell your mother you have to. I'll try. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Emily, can I carry your books home for you? Why, well, yeah, thank you. It isn't far. Oh, excuse me one minute, Emily. Will you? Say, Bob, I'm only like to practice to get herbs on Long Highlands. Okay. I'm awful glad you're elected too, Emily. Emily, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You've been treating me so funny lately. Well, since you ask, I might as well say it right out. George, oh, goodbye, Miss Corcoran. Goodbye, Miss Corcoran. What is it? I don't like the whole change that's come over you in the last year. I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but I've got to tell the truth and shame the devil. A change? What do you mean? Well, up to a year ago, I used to like you a lot. And I used to watch you while you did everything because we'd been friends for so long. And then you began spending all your time with baseball. And you never stopped to speak to anybody. Not really speak, you didn't. And George, it's a fact. Ever since you've been elected captain, you've got awful stuck up and conceited. And all the girls say so. And it hurts me to hear them say it. But I gotta agree with them a little, because it's true. Well, gosh, Emily, I never thought such a thing was happening to me. I guess it's hard for a fellow not to have some false creep into his character. I always expect a man to be perfect, and I think he should be. Oh, well, I don't think it's possible for you to be perfect, Emily. Well, my father is, and as far as I can see your father is, there's no reason on earth why you shouldn't be, too. No, I feel it's the other way around. Men aren't actually good, but girls are. You might as well know right now, I'm not perfect. It's not as easy for a girl to be as perfect as a man, because, well, we girls are more, are more nervous. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 
I said all that about you, I don't know what made me say it. Emily. And now I can see that it's not the truth at all, and it's not important anyway. Emily, would you like an ice cream soda or something before you go home? Why, thank you. I would. Good afternoon, Mrs. Slocum. Stu? Good afternoon, George, Emily. George. Hello, George. Hello, Emily. What do you have? Why, Emily Webb, what have you been crying about? Well, uh, she got an awful scare, Mr. Morgan. That, that hardware store right in the wagon nearly ran her over. Everybody says that Tom Hawkins drives like a crazy man. Here. Take a good drink of water, Emily. You look all shook up. I tell you, you gotta look both ways before you cross Main Street these days. Gets worse every year. What do you have? I'll have a strawberry phosphate, Mr. Morgan. No, Emily, have a soda with me. Well... Two strawberry ice cream sodas, Mr. Morgan. Two strawberry ice cream sodas, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I want to tell you. There are 225 horses in Grover's Corners this minute I'm talking to you. State inspector was in here yesterday. Now they're bringing in these automobiles. Best thing to do is just stay home. Why, I can remember when dogs used to sleep in the middle of the street all day, and nothing ever come by to disturb them. There you are. Yes, Mrs. Ellis, be with you in a minute. What can I do for you? They're so expensive. No, don't tell you think about that, Emily. We're celebrating our election. You know what else I'm celebrating? No. I'm celebrating the fact that I've got a friend that tells me the things that ought to be told me. Well, George, please don't think of that now. I don't know what made me say it. It's not well, true. Well, you stick to it. I'm glad you spoke to me like you did. But you'll see. I'm going to change so quick. You bet I'll change. You know, I'm going to ask you a favor. If I go away to State Agricultural College next year, will you write me a letter once in a while? I certainly will. I certainly will, George. It seems like being away for years, you'd get out of touch with things. Maybe letters from Grover's Corner wouldn't be so interesting after a while. Grover's Corners is in a very important place when you think of, of all New Hampshire. But I think it's a lovely town. Well, the day wouldn't come when I wouldn't want to know everything about our town. I know that's true, Emily. Well, I'll try to make the letters interesting. You know, Emily, whenever I meet a farmer, I ask him if he thinks it's important to go to agricultural school to be a good farmer. Why, George? Yeah? And some of them even say it's a waste of time. So you can get all that information in the pamphlets the government sends out. And, and well, Uncle Luke's getting pretty old. He's about ready for me to start taking over his farm. Tomorrow, if I could. My. And like you say, being gone all the time in other places, meeting other people. Gosh, if anything like that can happen, I, I don't want to go away. I guess new people probably aren't any better than old ones. I bet they almost never are. And then. And Emily, I, I feel you're as good a friend as I've got. And I don't need to meet the people in other towns. But George, maybe it's important for you to go and learn about that cattle judging and soils and things. Of course, I don't know. Well, Emily, I'm going to make up my mind right now. I won't go. I'll tell Pa about it tonight. But George, I don't see why you have to decide right now. It's a whole year away. Well, Emily, I'm glad you spoke to me about that fault in my character. What you said was right, but there was one thing wrong in it. That's when you said I, I wasn't noticing people. Well, you, for instance, you say you're watching me all the time while I did everything. Well, I was doing the same about you. Well, sure, I always make sure where you're sitting on the bleachers and who you're with. And for three days, I've tried to walk home with you, but something's always gotten in the way. Like, like yesterday, I was waiting for you over by the wall, and you walked home from this courtroom. Oh, George, life's awful funny. How could I have known that? I thought that well, you listen, wanted to... Listen, Emily. I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to agricultural school. I feel that, that once you found someone you're very fond of, well, of course, is fond of you, too, and likes you well enough to be interested in your character, well, I think that's just as important as this college is. That's what I think. I think that's awfully important, too. Emily, if I do make a big change and improve, would you be... I mean, could you be? I, I am now, and I always have been. So I guess it's a pretty important talk you've been having. Yes. Yes.
If you wait a minute, Emily, I'll walk you home. Mr. Morgan, I'm going to have to go home to get the money to pay you for this. What's that? George Gibbs. Do you mean to tell me that? No, Mr. Morgan, I have reasons. Look, here's my pocket watch to keep until I come back with the money. That's all right, George. Keep your watch. I'll trust you. I'll be back in five minutes, Mr. Morgan. I'll trust you ten years, George, not a day over. Got all over your shock, Emily? Why, yes, thank you, Mr. Morgan. It was nothing. Well, I'm ready. Well, now let's get on with the wedding. There are a lot of things to be said about a wedding. There are a lot of thoughts to go on during a wedding. Now, I can't get them all into one wedding naturally, especially not into Wedding Grover's Corners, where weddings are mighty short in play. Now, in this play, I take the part of the minister. That gives me the right to say a few things more. Yes, for one, another play gets pretty serious. You see, some churches say that marriage is a sacrament. I don't quite know what that means, but I can guess. Like Mrs. Gibbs said a few minutes ago, people are supposed to live two by two. This is a good wedding. The people are pretty young, but they come from a good state when they chose right. The real hero of the scene isn't on the stage at all, and we all know who that is. Like one of those European fellows said, every time a child is born into the world, it's nature's attempt to create a perfect human being. Well, we've seen nature pushing and contriving for some time now. We all know she's interested in quantity, but I think she's interested in quality too. Maybe she's trying to make another good governor for New Hampshire. That's what Emily hopes. And don't forget the other witnesses at this wedding, the ancestors, millions of them. Most of them set out to live two by two, millions of them. Well, that's all my sermon. It wasn't very long anyway. sort of thing in weddings in the old days. Roman later. We're more civilized now. So they say. George? George? George, what's the matter? Well, I don't want to grow old. Why is everybody pushing me so? Why, George, you want this? Well, Ma, listen to me. No, no, George, you're a man now. Well, for the last time, I'll ask you, all I want to do is be a fella. George, if anyone should hear you, Where's Emily? George, you gave me such a turn. It's true, Mom, I'm getting married. Let me catch my breath a minute. Now, Mom, you say Thursday nights. You'll see. Every Thursday night, Emily and I will come over for dinner. And Mom, you look all funny. What have you been crying for? Mom, we've got to get ready for this. Now, now, don't get upset. But, Papa, I don't want to get married. Everything's all right. 
Why can't I stay for a while just as I am? Let's go away. No, no, Emily, you mustn't think of such things. But Papa, don't you remember what you used to always say all the time? That I was your girl. There must be lots of places we could go to. I'd work for you. I can keep house. No, no, Emily. Stop and think a minute. You're just nervous. Now, now. George? George, will you come here a minute? Well, you're making the best young fellow in the whole world. George is a fine young fellow. But, Papa. I'm giving away my daughter, George. Do you think you can take care of her? Mr. Webb, I want to. I want to try. I'm going to do my best, Emily. I love you. I, mean, I need you. If you love me, help me. All I want is someone to love me. I will, Emily. Emily, I'll try. I mean forever. Do you hear? Forever and ever. Take this woman, Emily. Perfectly wedding. lovely wedding. Have the loveliest wedding I ever saw. Oh, I do love Richard a good Ford. wedding, don't you? Doesn't she make a lovely bride? I do. And do you, Emily, take this man, George, to be your wife? Don't know husband. when I've seen such have a lovely wedding, but I always cry. Don't know why it is, but I always cry. I just like to see you so happy, don't you? Oh, I think it's lovely. I do. Three. I've married 200 couples in my day. Do I believe in it? I don't know. I suppose I do. And Mary Zed. Millions of them. The cottage, the go-kart, the Sunday afternoon drives in the Ford, the first rheumatism, the grandchildren, the second rheumatism, the deathbed, the reading of the will. Once in a thousand times, it's interesting. Gradual changes in Grover's Corners. Horses are getting rarer. Farmers are coming into town now in Forbes. Everybody locks their house doors now at night. Ain't been any burglars in town yet, but everybody's heard about them. You'd be surprised, though. On the whole, things don't change much around here. This is certainly an important part of Grover's Corners. It's on a hilltop, a windy hilltop. Lots of sky, lots of clouds, often lots of sun and moon and stars. You come up here on a fine afternoon and you can see range on range of hills. Awful blue they are. Up there by Lake Sunapee and Lake Winnipesaukee. And if you go way up, you can see the White Mountains in Mount Washington, where North Conway and Conway is. And of course our favorite mountain, Mount Monadnock, is right here. And all around it lie these towns. Jaffrey and North Jaffrey, and Peterborough and Dublin. And there, quite a ways down is Grover's Corners. Yes, beautiful spot up here. Mounts and laurel and lilacs. This here is a new part of the cemetery. 
1660 to 1670. A strong line of people that came a long ways to be independent. Some are people walk around there and laugh at funny words on the tombstones. They don't do any harm. And genealogists come up from Boston, get paid by city people for looking to look up their ancestors. They want to make sure their daughters of the American Revolution know the Mayflower. Well, I guess that do, that don't do any harm either. Over here are some Civil War veterans. Iron flags on their graves. New Hampshire boys had a notion that the Union ought to be kept together, though they'd never seen more than 50 miles up themselves. All they knew was the name, friends, the United States of America. The United States of America. And they went and died about it. This here's the new part of the cemetery. There's your friend, Mrs. Gibbs, and Mr. Stimson, the choir director of the Congregational Church. And this is so who enjoyed the wedding so much, remember? Own a lot of others. There's Editor Webb's boy, Wallace, whose appendix burst when he was on a camping trip to Crawford Notch. Yes, an awful lot of sorrows who were quieted down up here. People just wild with grief brought the relatives up to the sill. And then times, sunny days, rainy days, snow. We all know how it is. A lot of thoughts come up here night and day, but there's no post office. Now there are th some things that we all know but we don't take them out and look at them very often. We all know that something is eternal. And it ain't houses and it ain't names. It ain't the earth, it ain't even the stars. Everyone knows in their bones that something is eternal. And that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people ever lived have been telling us that for 5,000 years. And yet you'd be surprised at how people are always letting go of that fact. There's something way down deep that's eternal about every human being. You know, the dead don't stay interested in us living people for very long. Gradually, gradually they let go of hold of the earth and the ambitions they had and the pleasures they had and the things they suffered and the people they loved. They get weaned away from the earth. That's the way I put it, weaned away. Yes, they stay here while the earth part of them burns away, burns out. And all that time they slowly get indifferent to what's going on in Grover's Corners. They're waiting. They're waiting for something they feel is coming. Something important and great. Aren't they waiting for the eternal part in them to come out clear? Now, some of the things they say maybe will hurt your feelings, but that's the way it is. Mother and daughter, husband and wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser. All those terribly important things kind of grow pale around here. And what's left? What's left when your memory's gone and your identity, Mrs. Smith? Well, here are some of the people. There's Joe Stoddard, our undertaker, supervising a new-made grave. And here comes Sam Craig, the Grover's Corners boy that left town to go out west. Good afternoon, Joe Stoddard. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Let me see here. Do I know you? I'm Sam Craig. Well, Grace, the sake's alive, of all people. I should have known you'd be back for the funeral. You've been away a long time, Sam. Yes, I've been away over 12 years. I'm in business at a buffalo now, Joe, but I was in the East when I got news of my cousin's death, so I thought I'd combine things a little and come back and see the old home. You look well. Yes, can't complain. Very sad our journey today, Samuel. Yes. Yes, I always say I hate to supervise when a young person is taken. They'll be here in a minute. I had to come out early today. I left my son supervising at the home. Old Farmer McCarthy. I used to do chores for him after school. He had lumbago. Yes, we brought Farmer McCarthy up here a number of years ago now. Why, this is my Aunt Julia. I'd forgotten that she... Of course, of course. Yes, Doc Gibbs lost his wife two or three years ago about this time, and today's another bad blow for him, too. That's my sister Carrie's boy, Sam. Sam Craig. I'm always uncomfortable when they're around. Simon. Do they choose their own verses much, Joe? No, not usually. Mostly the bereaved pick of verse. Why, it doesn't sound much like Aunt Julia. Well, there aren't many of those Hersey sisters left, I suppose. Now, let me see. I wanted to take a look at my father and mother. Oh, over there with the Craigs on Avenue F. He was a choir director at church. Drank a lot, we used to say. Well, nobody was supposed to know about it. He'd seen a peck of trouble. Took his own life, you know? Oh, did he? Yes, he hung himself in the attic. They tried to keep it hush-hush, but of course it got around. He chose his own epitaph. You can see it there. It ain't a verse exactly. Why, it's just some notes of music. What is it? Oh, I wouldn't know. It was wrote up in the Boston paper at the time. 
Joe, what did she die of? Who? My cousin. Oh, didn't you know? She had some trouble bringing a baby into the world. It was her second, though. Let me see, there's a boy about four years old. And the grave's gonna be over here? Yes, there isn't much more room over here among the Gibbs. So they're opening up a whole new Gibbs section over on Avenue B. Oh, I see they're coming, you'll have to excuse me. Winds always do the same thing, don't they? If it ain't a rain, it's a three-day blow. 
But Mother Gibbs, while you can go back to the living, I feel it. I know it. I just then, for a moment, I was thinking about, about the farm. For a moment, I was there. And my baby was on my lap as plain as day. Yes, of course you can. You mean I can go back and live all those days over again? Why not? All I can say is, Emily, don't. But it's true, isn't it? I can go back and live all those days over again? Yes. Some have tried, but they soon come back here. Emily, don't do it. Emily, don't. It's not what you think it would be. But I won't live over a sad day. I'll choose a happy day. I'll choose the day I first knew I loved George. Oh, no! No! Why should that be painful? You not only live it, but you watch yourself live it. Yes. And as you watch it, you see the thing that they, down there, never know. You see the future. You know what's going to happen afterwards. Is that painful? Why? That's not the only reason you shouldn't do it, Emily. When you've been here longer, you'll see that. Our life here is to forget all that and to think of what is ahead and prepare for what is ahead. When you've been here longer, you'll understand. But Mother Gibbs, how could I ever forget that life? It's all I know. It's all I had. Oh, Emily, it isn't wise. Really, it isn't. But it's a thing I must know for myself. I'll choose a happy day and No. Anyway. At least choose an unimportant day. Choose the least important day of your life. It will be important enough. And it can't be since I was married or since the baby was born. I can choose a birthday at least, can't I? I choose my 12th birthday. All right. It's February 11th, 1899, a Tuesday. Do you want any special time of day? Oh, I went the whole day. We'll begin at dawn. You remember it had been snowing for several days, but it stopped the night before, and they just begun clearing the roads. The sun's coming up. Well, there's Main Street. Why, that's Mr. Morgan drugstore before he changed it. And there's the livery stable. Yes, it's 1899. This is 14 years ago. Oh, that's the town I knew as a little girl. And look, there's the white fence that used to be around our house. I'd forgotten that. I loved it so. Are they inside? Yes. Your mother will be coming downstairs in a minute to fix breakfast. Will she? And you remember, your father had been away for several days. He came back on the early morning train. No. He'd been back to his college to make a speech in western New York, in Clinton. Look, there's how we knew so. And there's our policeman. But he's dead. He died. Whoa, Bessie. Morning, Belle. Morning, Howie. You're up early. Been rescued a party. Darn near froze to death down by Polish down there. Got drunk and lay out in the snow drifts. Thought I was in bed when I shook him. Well, there's no crow. Morning, Mr. Warren. Morning, Howie. Morning, Morning Joe. Joe. Children, Wally, Emily, time to get up. Mama, I'm here. Oh, how young Mama looks. I didn't know Mama was ever that young. You can come and dress by the kitchen fire if you'd like, but hurry. Oh, good morning, Mr. Newsom. Morning, Miss Webb. Oh, it's cold. Yep, timble out by my barn, Miss Webb. Think of it. Will you keep yourself wrapped up? Come on, Bessie. Mama, I can't find my blue hair ribbon anywhere. Just open your eyes, dear, that's all. I laid it out for you special on your dresser there. If it were a snake, it'd bite you. Yes. Yes. Morning, Bill. Morning, Mr. Webb. You're up early? Yes, just went back to my college up in New York State. Been any trouble here? I was called up this morning to rescue a Polish fella. Darn near froze to death he was. You must get it in the paper. One much. Good morning, Mother. How'd it go, Charles? Oh, fine, I guess. I told them a few things. Everything all right here? Yes. Can't think of anything that's happened special. Been right cold. Ty Newsom says it's in below over to his barn. Yes, well, it's colder than that up at Hamlin College. Students' ears are falling off. It ain't Christian. Paper have any mistakes in it? None that I noticed. Coffee's ready when you want it. Oh, and Charles, don't forget, it's Emily's birthday. Did you remember to get her anything? Yes, I've got her something here. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? Charles, don't interrupt her now. You can see her at breakfast. She's slow enough as it is. 
Now hurry up, children. I don't want to call you again. Mama, I'm here. I've grown up. I can't look at everything hard enough. Can I go in? table. Mama, you shouldn't have. I can't. I can't. It's like birthday or no birthday, I want you to eat your breakfast good and slow. I want you to grow up to be a good, strong girl. That and the blue paper's from your Aunt Carrie, and I reckon you can guess who brought the postcard album. Found it on the door set when I brought in the milk. George Gibbs. Must come over in the cold pretty early. George, I'd forgotten that. Oh. You chew that bacon good and slow. It'll help keep you warm on a cold day. But Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Fourteen years have gone by. I'm dead. Your grandmother. Wally's dead, too. His appendix burst on a camping trip to Crawford Notch. We felt just awful about it. Don't you remember? Mama, now we're all here together. Just for a moment. Let's be happy. Let's look at one another. That in yellow paper is something I found in the attic among your grandmother's things. Well, you're old enough to wear it now, and I thought you'd like it. And this is from you. Why, it's just lovely, and it's just what I wanted. It's beautiful. Well, I'd hoped you'd like it. Hunt it all over. Your Aunt Nora couldn't find one in Concord, so I had to send all the way to Boston. Oh, yes, and Wally has something for you, too. He made it manual training class, and he's very proud of it. Make sure you make a big fuss about it. Oh, yes, and your father has something for you, too. Don't know what it is myself. Shh, here he comes. Where's my girl? Where's my birthday girl? I can't. I can't go on. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. So all that is going on, and we never noticed. Take me back up the hill to my grave. But first, wait. One more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners. Mama and Papa. The clock's ticking. And my butternut tree. And Mama's sunflowers. And the food and the coffee. And the new iron dresses and the hot baths and the sleeping and the waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anyone to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute? No. Saints and poets, maybe. They do some. I'm ready to go back. Were you happy? No. I should have listened to you. That's all human beings are. Just blind people. Look, it's clearing up. The stars are coming out. Oh, Mr. Stimson, I should have listened to them. Yes, now you know. Now you know what it was to be alive. To move about in a cloud of ignorance. To go up and down, trampling on the feelings of those about you. To spend and waste time as if you had a million years. To be always at the mercy of one self-centered passion or another. Now you know that's the happy existence you wanted to go back to. Ignorance and blindness. That ain't the whole truth and you know it, Simon Stimson. Emily, look at that star. I forget its name. My boy Joel was a sailor. Knew them all. Used to sell the porch evenings and tell them all by name. Yes, sir. Wonderful. A star's mighty good company. Yes, yes it is. There's one of them coming. That's funny. Take no time for him to be here. Goodness sakes. Mother Gibbs, it's George. Shh. It's George. And my Joel, who knew the stars. 
He used to say that it took millions of years for that little speck of light to get down to Earth. Don't seem like a body could believe it, but that's what he used to say. Millions of years. Goodness, that ain't no way to behave. He ought to be home. Mother Gibbs? Yes, Emily? Life people don't understand, do they? No, dear, they don't understand. Shorty Hawkins has just watched the Albany train go by. And at the delivery stable, somebody's setting up late and talking. Yes, it's clear enough. There are the stars, doing their own old crisscross in the skies. The scholars haven't settled the matter yet, but they seem to think that there are no living beings up there, just chalk or fire. Only this one is straining away. It's straining away all the time to make something of itself. The strain's so great that every 16 hours, everybody lies down and gets a rest. Hmm. 11 o'clock in Grover's Corners. Everyone's resting in Grover's Corners. Tomorrow's gonna be another day. You get a good rest, too. Good night.